Dwaitahilam. Our today's speaker, Professor Asi Pradhan, is now present in this hall. So I request all the dignitaries to have your seat on the dais. Uh, our heads are Professor Anand Mishraji, Professor Asi Pradhan, sir, Professor S.P. Pandey, sir. I request you all to take your seats, please. A very good morning and a warm welcome to all of you. As you know that under the collaboration, celebration of Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, Radha Krishnan lecture series on philosophy and religion is going on in our department. And today we are lucky enough that in this series, a profound learner and eminent scholar of Sri Aurobindo, Professor R.C. Pradhan, is present among us. So in this session, we are going to listen to him. But before we begin the main segment of the program, we have to follow our tradition. So first of all, I request my younger brother, assistant professor of this department, Dr. Rajiv request to Rajiv ji to perform Mangla Charan. And in this precious moment, I would like to request all the dignitaries who are present on the dais to simultaneously uh, to lighten the lamp and to present garland to Mahamana. Oh. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Rudeva Maheshwara, Guru Sakhat Pura. Tasmai Sri Guru Be Nama Tasmai Sri Guru Be Nama Bhakra Tunda Mahaka Suya Koti Sama Nirvignam Kuruma Devasa Sarvaka Su Sarvada Sarvaka Su Sarvada Thank you very much. And now I request Sneha and Kajol to perform our Kulgeet. Madhur Mano Har Ativ Sundar Ye Sarva Vira Ye Raj Dhali Ye Raj Dhali Madhur Mano Har Ativ Sundar Ye Sarva Vira Ye Raj Dhali Ye Raj Dhali ये तीनों लोगों से न्यारी काशी सुगंधि भर्म और सत्यशी बसी है गंगा हिरम्य तट पर ये सर्व विद्या निराज धानी राज धानी 
राजधानी राजधानी भवे देश्वर की सत्यवाणी बने जिन्हें पढ़ के ब्रह्म ज्ञानी थे व्यास रचे यही पर ये ब्रह्म विद्या राजधानी राजधानी वो मूर्ति पद को मिलाने वाले सुधर वाले यही फले फूल बुद्ध शंकर ये राज ऋषियों राजधानी राजधानी सुरम्य धाराए वरुणासी नहाए जिन में कबीर तुलसी भला हो कविता का क्यों आ ये बाग वेद्या राजधानी राजधानी विविध कला अर्थ शास्त्र गायन गणित खनिज आशीन सायन प्रति ची प्राची कमीन सुंदर ये विश्व विद्या राजधानी राजधानी ये मालवी जी के देश भक्ति ये उनका साहस ये उनके शांति ये मालवी जी के देश भक्ति ये उनका साहस ये उनके शांति प्रकट हुए है नवीन होकर ये कर्म वीरो राजधानी राजधानी मधुर मनोहर अतीब सुंदर ये सर्व विद्या वीरा
scholars who are present offline or online. I welcome you all. I hope you would enjoy the lecture of Professor Pradhan. Thank you. बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद सर इसके पहले कि हम अपने कार्यक्रम के मुख्य विषय की तरफ जाएं और प्रोफेसर आरसी प्रधान सर को सुनने के लिए उद्यत हो इस हॉल में मैडम प्रधान भी उपस्थित हैं और एक अर्धांगिनी के धर्म का अनुसरण करते हुए अनुगामिनी रहती हैं मैं चाहती हूं कि करतल ध्वनि उनके लिए आप सभी बजाए और अब थोड़ा भी विलंब न करते हुए मैं आग्रह करूंगी सर विदाउट एनी फर्दर फॉर्मेलिटीज आई वुड लाइक टू कॉल अपॉन इन द डायस थैंक यू रेस्पेक्टेड प्रोफेसर पांडे रेस्पेक्टेड प्रोफेसर मिश्रा एंड वाइफ माई डियर डॉक्टर श्रुति मिश्रा एस्टीम्ड कोलीग्स स्टूडेंट्स एंड रिसर्चर्स लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन आई एम रियली ग्रेटली प्रिविलेज टू बी इन्वाइटेड टू डिलीवर ए लेक्चर ऑन सी अरविंद इन द डॉक्टर राधा कृष्ण सीरीज आई ऑलवेज डीम इट ए ग्रेट प्रिविलेज टू बी इन दिस डिपार्टमेंट एज इट हैज बीन सेट Uh, the department and the university is my alma mater and uh, uh, i always uh, think that banaras and the banaras in the university is my spiritual home so that is the kind of link uh, i have with this department but anyway it is uh, really always a great uh, uh, pleasure to be with all of you and do it uh our colleagues here and do the students uh let me begin with a few introductory remarks that the as it has been rightly pointed out by professor mishra uh aurobindo studies has been one of the special concerns of this department and uh, there has been a chair for for aurobindo professor chair uh which uh, professor pandey is uh, presently occupying but there have been many uh, scholars who have occupied this chair uh, when i was a student here professor arindam basu was the uh, chair professor so in a sense aurobindo studies is not alien to this de department and perhaps now it has been part of the university curricula throughout the country aurobindo study centers have been uh, found elsewhere so it will be really a great uh, occasion for me to speak on si aurobindo but i must admit that i am not a aurobindo scholar so i am a, still a student of uh, si aurobindo's philosophy uh, so that is my special interest as professor misra also pointed out i took interest more in western philosophy than in indian philosophy but especially uh, philosophy of sarab siorobindo brought me back to indian philosophy in uh, however indirect way it may be let us begin with uh, the idea of who siorobindo is why should we study him now uh Aurobindo is not simply a pro, uh, philosopher he was never an academic philosopher he didn't serve in any university he established his own ashram and all his books have been published from the ashram but ashram it, itself is a university but he never taught there people taught there but he never taught he the guru in that sense your guru is profoundly significant in indian tradition it doesn't mean just one who teaches in the classroom but 
it means one who can influence generations of people through his writings and through his speeches. So in that sense, he is a great teacher, a great professor, sorry, a great philosopher, but a great poet as well. He is not only a philosopher, but also a poet, a visionary, a seer, so to speak. The word seer comes from the ancient tradition, where the seer is the drashta, one who sees the truth. He doesn't think about the truth, but he sees the truth. Then, therefore, he is the satya drashta. And Sri Aurobindo is the drashta. And in Indian parlance, a philosopher is also a drashta. Because for us, philosophy is darshana. Darshana means to see. And Drashta is one who sees the truth. So in that sense, in Indian parlance, he is uh, a philosopher. So the question that arises is, what is Sri Aurobindo's relevance to today's world? When the world is going through different conflicts, social, moral, and economic, how can Sri Aurobindo's message of supermanhood make any sense? One can ask. How can he message of the arrival of the supramental age will make sense to a modern generation which he doesn't know even what is to be rational properly? So in this twilight uh, age, this is the age of twilight, Sandhyakal, the past is gone, we are not sure of our past, and the future is uncertain. And in this age of Sandhya Kal, the twilight, what will be the relevance of Sri Aurobind? Will he be a pathfinder for us? Will he bear the searchlight for us? Will he be the beacon light for us? My answer is yes. Since this is the time when our past we do not know, and our future we are not certain of. And Sri Aurobindo comes to tell us, tell us not to be disheartened, to look to the future. In fact, he will say, look within yourself, and you will find the future in it. So therefore, Sri Aurobindo, as a person, as a philosopher, and his massive philosophical writings, make sense. Let us now see what are the ideas on which he built his philosophy. What are the sources of Sri Aurobindo's philosophy? Is it the West or is it the East? Where did he look to get his philosophical inspiration? As we know, every philosopher is the product of an ace, is the child of an ace and of a culture. No philosopher can start thinking anew or completely de novo. That is not possible because every human being is part of a tradition and a culture. So in that sense, it is right to suggest that Sri Aurobindo must have his sources somewhere. He was born, not though he was born in India, to a, wealthy, a very wealthy and uh, uh, educated family. But he studied in England. All his education happened in England. Because his family, especially his father, who was a doctor, wanted him to be a perfect Englishman, a perfect, pure and simple Englishman. And that again, his father wanted him to be an IS, IS, ICS officer, equivalent of the present IAS officer. So these are the dreams which his family heard, and with that, he was sent to England. But see the destiny that took him away from England and to put him back to his motherland, India. He served in Baroda as a professor of English and French literature. Then as fate would have it, he was drawn into the uh, uh, freedom movement, early days of the freedom movement, 
which uh, happened after the partition of Bengal. He was drawn into active politics. And when politics didn't satisfy him, he retreated into the French colony called Pondicherry and started his sadhana, which took him almost 40 years to accomplish his dream project of uh, establishing a divine society, not only in the ashram, but uh, elsewhere in the whole world. In fact, that was his dream project. So this is the philosopher who traveled through a long, uh, long cultural, uh, uh, cultural traditions and came back to India. And with Benjians, he studied Indian literature, philosophy, spiritual traditions, Tantra included, yoga included. And in no time, he became accomplished in all these areas. And that is the source of his philosophy. So let me go back precise uh, source to which we can really trace his philosophical thoughts. It is to the Vedas and Upanishads that we must look back to. In his great book, The Secret of the Veda, has, he has propounded his own interpretation of the Vedic literature, and he has rejected the amount of literary interpretation that was given by the mostly the Western scholars and also Indian scholars, like Sayan and others, that Vedic literature is nothing but the early primitive poetry dedicated to the natural forces. But Sri Aurobindo found, to our great relief, that the Vedas were the products of highly developed minds called the Vedic Rishis. Rishi is again another term which I am profoundly fond of, and that also means a seer. Rishi is not just a genius, but a super genius who can see the things are right. So he really was inspired by the Vedic Upanishadic Rishis. And from that, he derived his philosophical ideas. His commentary on some of the Upanishads is really highly elevating and highly and very different from other uh, writings on uh, Upanishads. Uh, those who have time among the students can go back to his book on Upanishads. And there I find the very uh, foundation of his uh, philosophical ideas. He finds out the idea of supermind there and the idea of uh, the truth there. So that is the source of his philosophical ideas. He wrote on the Gitas, as you know, his famous book, Essays on the Gita. And that is also a marvel interpretation of a traditional text called the Bhagavad Gita. Many people have written on Bhagavad Gita, including our great Acharyas, like Sankaracharya, uh, Ravanujacharya, and other Acharyas. But you find when you read the essays on the Gita, not exactly a commentary, but exactly an insightful interpretation of the Bhagavad Gita. And these are the marvelous texts in which we find his philosophy expounded. But the, his magnum opus definitely is the life divine. I think all students of philosophy do know that the life divine is a landmark development in the progress of Indian philosophy. Those who have, it is a massive book running into 1,000 and more pages. So it requires a great patience on the part of the reader. But that itself is a kind of sadhana. One who can read the life divine from page one to the page, last page, that itself will be a spiritual sadhana. But anyway, it is in this book that he has expounded his philosophy in thoroughgoing terms, in full details he has given. So that is how his philosophy came into being from these sources, which are definitely Upanishadic in spirit and later. What is the central concept then of his philosophy? Every student of philosophy will ask, what is central to his philosophy? 
He has written so massively that it is not difficult to read all the literature at a time within a short span of life. It may require the whole life itself. So in that sense, it is not easy to find out where we must begin. And I want to begin from somewhere. So that somewhere must come from the life divine itself. So life divine will be our starting point. And perhaps it will endlessly take us to his book, The, the Hour of God, The Synthesis of Yoga, and so many so forth. So where should we start then? Let me try to find this central concept in his life divine like this. The life divine itself, though it is a book, but it is also a, uh, as we say, it is a great book. It is not just a book. It is a great book called a Grantha. When we say it is a Grantha, it is not just any book. It is not Pustak. It is Granth. So it is must be a classic. And it is, though Savitri was his poetry composition, Savitri, you know, one of the greatest uh, epics of our time, though that is an epic form, but the life divine is no less epic. Epic in proportion, epic in insight, and epic in its magnificent ideas. So, if we look, go through the life divine, I find that his central philosophy is expounded in no uncertain terms. From the first chapter of human aspiration to the last chapter on the life divine or divine life, this is the great journey that, according to him, man most must take. From the human aspiration, he's talking about the human aspiration. And aspiration for what? Not to conquer the world, not for power, not for anything, but to gain, perhaps we can say, spiritual power or spirituality in uh, uh, spirituality in short. That means how to establish divine life in oneself and also in the external world. That becomes the motto of the life divine. So it is a journey from the human being to the divine. So the life divine really finds out the ways in which man will aspire for the divine and how man will proceed progressively through a trajectory of evolution to the divine. So this is the central concept of his philosophy, how man must become divine. So he does admit, and that is how the Vedantic uh, sources tell us, that man is already divine. So why is it necessary that man becomes divine? That is the crux of Sri Aurobindo's problem. If man is already divine, if he's already Brahman, as uh, Vedanta says, then why do you need a kind of effort? Or why do you need any yogic training to become divine? So this is where he has to solve the problem of becoming, the problem of becoming divine. So the two important concepts which struggle within his philosophy is being and becoming. The being, becoming the process of being. So one has to become the being. So becoming becomes necessary. So if there is only being, if there is only Brahman, and there is no becoming Brahman, then that makes it impossible for man to become Brahman. By saying that man is Brahman makes no sense unless man realizes Brahman. By realizing Brahman alone, you can become Brahman. So in that sense, becoming is very important. So what he found 
in the classical Vedanta philosophy is especially in, in the philosophies of the Acharyas. It has been taken for granted that Brahman is the ultimate truth. There is no doubt about it. He accepts that Brahman is the ultimate truth. That is the truth that Upanishads hinted at. And that is the truth for Sri Aurobindo also. But what is more important for him, how to become truth conscious? That is more important for us. For a man, it becomes uh, important how to become Brahman. So the concept of being is not enough. We have to bring in back the concept of becoming. And Sri Aurobindo starts with, though, he starts with the concept of being, the divine, he says, the Sasidananda, what he calls the ultimate reality. He sometimes he says the word God also. He doesn't make any significant difference between Brahman and God. Of course, there are differences in the traditional Advaita Vedanta, but Sri Aurobindo makes no such effort to make any kind of difference between Brahman and God. If by God we do not mean a creator God, we'll come back to the idea of creation. How does he handle it? Because that is the most challenging uh, concept in Indian tradition, especially Vedantic tradition, how to account for the becoming. So there is no doubt that he accepts that Brahman is the ultimate truth. That is the divine reality. Uh, sometimes he also fondly calls it divine mother. So he doesn't, he doesn't mean that by calling him mother, you are feminizing the ultimate reality. Not None of these are. But this is a figurative language he uses. He is the world mother. So in that sense, there is no reason why he should doubt that he is really a pure Vedantin and not a mixed Vedantin like a Tantra or uh, like Kasmir Saivism. He's a pure Vedanta, pure Upanishadic thinker. So in that sense, he's telling us that when Brahman is the ultimate reality, if you take it that way, what happens to man and what happens to the world? How do we account for the existence of man? And how to account for this man to attain uh, to the divinity? If man is just matter, as modern science says, that man is just a biological entity, or at, at worst, a physical entity, if that would have been the case, then Sri Aurobindo's philosophy would not have been possible at all, because this material being cannot be divine. Can you imagine a material being, a physical entity, becoming divine? So how ludicrous is this idea that man is a purely physical being? His brain is all, is all that matters and nothing else. But that would not have sufficed to understand the nature of man. So that there, Sri Aurobindo is telling us that we must go beyond the present concept of man, which has been propounded by the scientists and scientifically-minded philosophers, like the materialist, the naturalist, and also the empresses. So Sri Aurobindo has, therefore, to tell us something very, very different about the nature of man. The second idea is, what about this universe? How do you think of this universe? If Brahman is the ultimate reality, then what happens to this universe? Is the Brahm Then the universe is real or unreal? A traditional Advaitin will say, perhaps it is Maya, it is illusion. It's unreal. Why it is unreal? Because it is not Brahman. Brahman is the ultimate reality. So world, everything that uh, the world contains goes haywire. It becomes illusion. Sri Aurobindo thinks this must be a wrong interpretation of the word Maya itself. Or it is a wrong ascription of illusoriness to a concrete existence called the universe. The universe, as the scientist says, is really real. It is there very much with us. And without that, we cannot have any sustenance. So in that sense, the universe is also real. So Sri Aurobindo takes a dig at his predecessors. At least he thinks the Mayavadins, whether Sri Shankaracharya, Adi Shankaracharya is a Mayavadin or not, it is a matter of debate. 
but perhaps the word Maya was excessively used by the traditional Advaitins. If you read uh, Sandracharya's uh, Vivek Chudamani, for example, you will find the Maya in the sense of illusion has come with full force. The world becomes like a dream object. I think that is an excessive interpretation of the nature of the world. Yes, Brahman is real. But does that, does that necessarily mean that the world is also unreal? Why could this world not be Brahman itself? Why not we think that way? So Sri says that Brahman, the world itself is Brahman. So why are you searching for Brahman elsewhere? See it in the world. The entire world is a transformation of Brahman. The world, the universe itself is a form of the Brahman. Let us see how he can really tell us that the world itself is Brahman. Then in that set, sense, every material object will be Brahman. Of course, we will become Brahman. There is no doubt about it because Upanishads say, Aham Brahmasmi. So I am also Brahman. So everybody is Brahman. Then also the Upanishads say, Sar Sarvam idam khalu Brahman. Everything indeed is Brahman. If that is so, then why not see Aurobindo's idea that the universe itself is Brahman? It is not Maya at all. It is not an illusion. It is not an adhyasa by the human mind on the supreme reality called the Brahman. The human mind is so limited according to Sri Aurobindo. And therefore, its imposition on Brahma will be uh, definitely illusory. But Brahman, uh, the world itself cannot be illusory. Maybe my projection of the world may be illusory because we do project unnecessary things which are not real. Uh, so, in that sense, he will say that don't go for the mind to give us any indication as to what the Maya is. Of course, he admits that the word Maya itself is innocent because it has Vedic, Vedic origin. The Maya is, according to him, the creative power of Brahman to manifest this universe. If the universe is a manifestation of the Brahman, then the Brahman needs an extraordinary help to project or to manifest itself in the, in the form of the world. So there, one can say, you can introduce the notion of Maya. He calls it divine Maya in the life divine. The divine Maya is the way Brahman projects itself, not the human mind projects uh, something to the Brahman. The Brahman projects itself. The Brahman manifests itself in the form of the universe. So Brahman has to have creative power. Brahman has to have dynamic power. It cannot be a static Brahman. It cannot be just an abstract Brahman. Somewhere we do not know where he is, he or she. Of course, Brahman cannot be called he or she. It is a neutral term. So Brahman, uh, if it is a very abstract principle, we do not know how it will can explain the nature of the universe. So, uh, Sri Aurobindo goes to tell us that the Brahman is the ultimate reality, having creative power, and that is its divine Maya. And through that, it can really manifest the universe. So, universe and Brahman are no more dual from each other. In order to deserve this duality, you need not have to say the world is unreal. You can accept the duality of both do, uh, you can accept the reality of the world without admitting any duality. You are back to Advaita again. Advaita is there because that is the unassailable truth. Because truth is one, Brahman is one. Ekam Madityam. So there is no uh, digression from that truth. But the, the world in order to be real, it has to be Brahman itself. And how does it become Brahman? Because Brahman wishes it to be so. Then do you think that Brahman also has wishes and desires? This is the question we raise. Has Brahman wishes and desires? Like human beings, are you anthropomorphizing Brahman? Nothing of this sort. Sri Aurobindo says uh, that if universe, the if Brahman is the ultimate reality, why can you not allow it to have a supreme uh, will, a divine will? A divine will and Brahman are the same. 
So Brahman is Satsit Ananda, but why don't you allow another uh, another addition to Brahman? Brahman is also Chit Sakti, it is also truth power, it is also a divine power. So consciousness force, he says, he uses the word consciousness force. When we when we translate Brahman into Satchidananda, Satchidananda becomes existence, consciousness, and bliss, all hyphenated. But Sri Aurobindo always uses the word Satchidananda as one term, which includes both existence, truth, and also consciousness, which is according to me a force, a creative force. And of course, the last one is bliss. bliss. So in that sense, Satchidananda is a unifying term in a unified reality is an unitarian reality. So you can call it consciousness. If you call it consciousness, that also takes care of the whole reality. If you also call it existence, that also takes care of the whole reality. And if you simply call it ananda or bliss, that also takes care of the whole reality. So the whole reality is not divided into different aspects. It is one, the way you can look at it. So Sri Aurobindo emphasizes more on both, uh, on the uh, Brahman as the truth and Brahman as also the truth, consciousness. So in this sense, he is really taking us back to the uh, Vedantic uh, original idea that even if Brahman is the ultimate reality, we have to have the world also as identical with Brahman. If we can establish the identity of Brahman, identity of the world with the Brahman, then we can establish Advaita in the purest form. Of course, the last one is which traditional Advaita has propounded, Jiva Brahmeva Napara. The Jiva is also Brahman. Sri Aurobindo admits it. Because the Jiva or the individual self or the individual soul is also Brahman. But they are all identical. So in this sense, even if we accept that truth that the world is real and the individual soul is also real, but we can establish Advaita or non-dualism non like this. That world is also Brahman and the individual is also Brahman. We need not have to take the help of any Mahavada or the theory of appearance or the theory of superimposition or Adhyasa to explain the nature of the world. Let us come back to a little more about his theory of evolution, which is uh, very important for understanding the nature of the world. If the world is the Brahman, then how does it happen that the world also appears as a physical body or a sum of physical bodies? How does matter arise here? How does life arise here? And how does mind arise here? All these three questions are very important for any modern student of philosophy. How does matter come into existence? And how does life come into existence? And how does mind come into existence? The last one, the nature of the mind has been exercising the minds of philosophers across the globe at the present moment. We are still searching for a mind. The West is still searching for a mind. If you can go through the Western literature on philosophy of mind, you will find they are searching for a mind and they are yet to get a mind. But Sri Aurobindo started with the idea there is a mind which is real. And not only that, there is a life in the universal sense of the term, not only individual life, but so life as such is also real. The life of the animal is no less real, and life of human beings is equal, is also real. But also beyond that, there is the matter or the material existence. How do we account for this massive material universe? Sri Aurobindo has an explanation for it. If he believes that the world itself is Brahman, there is no gap between Brahman and the world, then it follows necessarily that the material universe is Brahman. That is, matter is also a form of Brahman. And by that logic also, life is also a form of Brahman. And by the same logic, mind is also a form of Brahman. How is this possible? That is the question that we must raise. Now, it follows logically from his 
first premises that the world is that the ultimate reality is Brahman, and rest of the things are going to be identical with Brahman. But how does this really happen? Because cosmos is not a mere static entity; it's a dynamic process. And science tells us, and our common sense also tells us that the world is evolving. The world is going farther and farther. If you take the Big Bang theory, that also one can explain that it is a way of explaining the world how it came into existence. And if you take Darwin's account of the progress of the universe, the evolution of the universe, that also shows he was concerned with the evolution of life. But that is how he tells us that through uh, selection of species, the nature is progressing from uh, the primitive animal organism to the higher animal organism. All these theories do point to the fact that the world is a dynamic process. It is an evolutionary process. The idea of evolution came to Sri Aurobindo definitely from the West in a certain sense, because he was aware of the 20th century philosophical traditions elsewhere, that philosophy is agog with the idea of evolution of the universe. Now, of course, Except biology, the uh, except in biology, evolution concept doesn't uh, greatly uh, influence people, or do not they do not accept it, because after the uh, arrival of many uh, philosophical ideas like uh, postmodernism, the idea of evolution also is abolished. The idea of evolution doesn't make any sense because postmodernism is more. Uh, more concerned with how everything is regressing, how it is going back, and not how it is progressing. The concept of progress is really outmoded, according to many postmodern thinkers. So Aurobindo is thinking in this scenario about how to account for the evolution of the universe, how to bring, how to bridge the gap between man and Brahman, how to bridge the gap between the world and Brahman. How to bridge the gap between man, sorry, between matter and Brahman. This is the biggest gap, matter and Brahman. They appear to be contradictory of each other. Brahman is consciousness and matter is unconscious. How can they come together? How by, by what kind of imagination you can say the this matter which is unconscious, supposedly unconscious, is also conscious. So that will be the greatest challenge for Sri and that is what Sri Aurobindo's philosophy is going to tell us, that this challenge also can be met from within Aurobindo's framework. The Aurobindo's integral framework, as you know, that is philosophy known as integral philosophy. If you have a standpoint called integralism, you can really integrate matter and mind and life with Brahman. And that is how Sri Aurobindo is going to do it. So in order to explain how evolution is possible, he cannot be satisfied with the modern theories of evolution, whether it is theory of emergent evolution of Samuel Alexander or Lloyd Morgan, or the theory of evolution of the creative evolution by Bob Schoen. So all these theories fall flat because they cannot account for how, from a material basis, you can really go forward uh, towards a greater goal, evolutionary goal, unless you really have much more metaphysical presuppositions. Uh, from matter, of course, if you start the process of evolution, then it will create more and material forms. It cannot really take us back to the deity which was promised by Samuel Alexander, or yes, well, Samuel Alexander is famous book, Space, Time, and Deity. Deity will never come because it is all matter that you are talking about. Matter goes into further matter. So, Sri Aurobindo says if you have to have the theory of evolution, you must have another theory called theory of evolution. Evolution must presuppose involution. Unless Brahman is already in matter, there cannot be any evolution of matter through different processes into Brahman. So matter cannot be uh, cannot become conscious unless or matter cannot give rise to mind and life, sorry, life and mind. Unless the mind is already in life and life is already in matter. That means ultimately Brahman must be in matter. That means consciousness must be in matter. Only then there can be any evolution of matter 
towards Brahma. So the, the stages of evolution are from matter to life to mind and the supermind, and then the Brahman, the Satchidananda. So these stages have to be explained. If you simply say these are the stages, that will not be philosophically satisfactory. You have to explain how this is possible. So Aurobindo says this is this, that matter itself has the rudiments of the Supreme Consciousness. The matter has the rudiments, the seed of consciousness, and life also has the seed of consciousness. And mind also has the seeds of consciousness. In fact, mind is more conscious in that sense than life in general is. So, in this sense, he is telling us that involution must be taken as one of the premises for the theory of evolution. But how does evolution, how does involution take place? How does this uh, unique idea of Brahman being involved in matter take place? What is that process? Let us imagine Brahman is the, at the apex. How does it really come to the base? Because evolution starts with a base and it goes to an apex. How this process goes? How this reality is already involved, that is the word involution, in this matter? So he has the idea of a descent, that Brahman, out of his own divine will, has descended into matter. That is to say that Brahm matter has already concealed within itself consciousness. Matter has itself concealed within itself life, and matter itself has concealed the mind. So if this is accepted, then the process of evolution can start. Here the question arises, if Brahman is already in matter, what is the necessity of Brahman again going back to itself? Because evolution is ultimately going back to itself by the Brahman. Because the entire drama takes place in the hands of Brahman. Brahman descends into matter and matter ascends to Brahman. So these two theories of ascent and descent in Sri philosophy you have to accept. Even if it appears illogical or very much little logical because to the modern mind everything should be everything should be tested through logic if not by experience of course experience cannot help us here logic can help so if matter and brahman are contradicted with each other then the law of contradiction should operate if matter and consciousness are contradictory of each other as descartes tell, told us that matter and mind cannot are not of the same nature, though they can go together, but they are not of the same nature. So there is some kind of contradiction between matter and Brahman. So then how to resolve this contradiction? And there is also a contradiction, supposed contradiction, how Brahman with consciousness becomes unconscious matter or apparent, apparently unconscious matter. How does it happen? How descent takes place? And then again, how the ascent takes place? Now, this appears not to fit into the logic, as we know, the logic called formal logic, because if P, then not P and not P cannot go together, the two opposites cannot go together, then how Brahman and matter, two opposites can go together, in fact, ultimately become identical. Therefore, he appears to something called the logic of the infinite. How can we explain this? Then he says, think about the logic of the infinite. The infinite consciousness has its own logic, just as the finite consciousness for the human mind has its own logic. So in order to understand this, we have to appeal to the logic of the infinite. The infinite consciousness chooses to or wills to limit itself in the form of finite entities called matter, life, and mind. These are all finite entities. So the Brahman, which is infinite, chooses to become finite. That is how he tells us that the logic of infinite must really uh, must be appealed to to explain these facts. Now, let us come back to the uh, other aspect of the problem. How does the idea of a supermind evolve 
or how does the supramental consciousness evolve? That was the greatest uh, challenge for Sri Aurobindo to tell us how supramental uh, life is possible, how supramental beings are possible, and how supermind itself becomes a new reality in the universe. For this, he again depends on the idea of evolution and involution. If Brahman is already in matter, life, and mind, then it is possible for the human mind to proceed towards or evolve towards the super mind. The super mind really becomes a higher mind, a more illumined mind, a more intuitive mind. This is the different stages of the mental development takes place before we reach the super mind or supramental consciousness. Let us throw some light on the idea of a super mind. We all know what mind is. That mind is that we think, mind is that which perceives, which organizes our experience, mind is that which gives us enough conceptual power to build a model of the universe, and this is how science proceeds. And the greatest achievement of human mind are sciences, and perhaps the technologies, literature, philosophy, art, and everything. So human mind is no less a capable uh, entity that the universe has evolved. But what Sri Aurobindo is looking at is how can we go beyond this mind? That means beyond the present achievements of man, how can we think of something greater? This is the most challenging question for Sri Aurobindo. First of all, if mind is does everything, then why you need a super mind? This is one question. Then, if mind has achieved so profound things, do you think super mind can achieve more and more profound things? And what is the guarantee? Now, all these questions are uh, really pressed into this framework that super mind has to solve some of the problems which mind has not solved. Sri Aurobindo is a philosopher of mind, definitely, but he's also a philosopher beyond the mind because he sees the other side of the mind. Why he calls mind a limited entity? In fact, he says mind is a passage, not a destination. Mind is a passage because it is the transitional way of our dealing with the universe. So if there is a mind, there must be a universe which mind is struggling with. And mind also brings about a social harmony, social texture. Therefore, the mind brings all this that we are presently having. What we call rationality is also a product of this mental process or mental development. So in a sense, this age in which we are living is called the age of reason. And Sri Aurobindo has no doubt that the age of reason has achieved great many things. But he's equally uh, aware of the fact that man has failed in many other things. First of all, man has failed to look beyond the present. Man has failed to see beyond his own achievements. In fact, the same mind is destroying what it has built. You look at the idea of a war, how the same war, which war brings everything down to down to earth, down to the dust. Again, man builds off out of the assets of the world. This is how mind works. It builds and again destroys, rebuilds. It goes on eternally destroy, building, destroying, building, destroying, and ultimately it is frustrated. It becomes defunct. Therefore, he cannot really establish a, either a true society, a harmonious society, a warless society, a peaceful society at the social level. It cannot, even if it produces great sciences, it doesn't provide the enough understanding of the real universe. We are still far away from understanding the real universe. I mean, scientists tell us that we are not known the full truth about the universe. We are all conjecturing and through conjecture, we are refuting 
as Karl Pepper says, and we are going further conjectures. We are not sure of what that ultimate reality itself is. So science cannot give us what ultimate reality is. Philosophy is busy in quarreling among themselves. One philosophy says one thing, another philosopher says something very different. If there is a Marxist among us, he will say all of that you are talking is a humbug. So look at the human mind. Here is a mind who says there is a bright light before us and the other says all oh, there is darkness. So how to account for this? Because our, we have been taught by the Upanishad that we have to search for light from darkness. So if we are in tamas, then we have to go for jyoti. But if somebody says there is only tamas, and from a tamas to you have to go to tamas, is this satisfying? That philosophy says you go from one darkness to another darkness. But that is not a satisfying philosophy. At least Aurobindo is not satisfied. <laughs> he tells us that this must be a wrong, wrong idea of the mind. Mind is limited. Mind is finite. Let us admit this and then try to go beyond the mind. And that is where he brings in the concept of supermind. <clears throat> a supermind, therefore, doesn't become <clears throat> a mind which is unusually different from the present mind. It is this mind which magnifies itself into superior powers or which possesses superior power. All that we see is diversity. You are, you, me, and others. This conflict goes on, you, me, and others. The entire human world is divided between me and the other. And there is conflict between me and the other. We are yet to solve how to know the other mind. That is a great uh, idea of uh, the Western uh, thinking, how to know the other mind. One doesn't know how to really explain this. So one can say that we are really quibbling about something we know. I know what you are thinking at this moment. But yet, I philosophically, I will say, do I know you? Do I know your mind? All these are philosophical disabilities because we do not know the unity of things. We do not know the truth. That is the final judgment about the mind. Mind cannot lead us to the truth. So in order to know the truth, we must have a super mind, a mind which is more capable, more sensitive to truth, a mind which is truth conscious, and that is the supermind. If supermind, if possible, let us admit it is possible. Why? Because if mind is possible, if mind has evolved out of matter, life, then why not a supermind? That is Sriorabindas logic. That if mind has come into being, then supermind also must come into being. That is the force of the evolutionary process. That is the evolutionary necessity, you can say. If there is no mind, super mind, let us create one, he will say. If there is no super mind already, let us create one. In the sense that let us try to get one. Let us try to be superhuman, sorry, super men, supramental, if we can really try. That is his message. With this idea, he brings say, the idea of yoga. The idea of yoga has really got a very popular uh, image now that yoga is nothing but a physical exercise, something health oriented. It is a part of health regime. But that is not this yoga that he is talking of. Yoga is the union of man with the divine. Yoga means union. So he takes the clue from the Gita because Gita is the greatest yoga sastra. It is Brahma Vidya and also Yoga Sastra. So why it is Yoga Sastra? Because it teaches yoga how to implement your ideas in the actual life. So yoga is how to unite this man, this little man, this finite man with the infinite Brahman. If it is possible, he says, yes, it is possible. Because your mind, which is finite, has already the seeds of infinitude seed of the infinite consciousness. Your consciousness, which we have, we call the normal human consciousness, is also having the potentiality of becoming a divine consciousness. This is possible in different forms, different ways, 
A poet may realize it through his poetry composition. A singer can realize through his singing. A dancer can realize through his dancing. A teacher can realize this Brahman consciousness through his teaching. A student can realize it through his reading and through his really, really thinking. So every thinking being is capable of knowing, capable of being, capable of going beyond himself or herself. If this is not the case, then what is to be a human being? Had it not been the case, how can somebody compose a song like Ye Sarva Vidya Ki Rajadhani? Look at this song. The great uh, scientist composed it. Yes, Santi Sarup Bhatna. The scientist composed this. Such a mesmerizing song. It should not be only a university song. It can be a universal song. When I hear this song in so beautiful voice, that is the divinity that I realize that a man who has composed this must be inspired by a divine idea of a universal capital of knowledge. Banaras may be capital in the physical sense, but if you take it poetically, that is the Sarva Vidya Ki Rajadhani. What a fantastic idea of imagination the poet must have. This is how a poet realizes divinity. So through different activities, we realize, we realize divinity. So yoga is really compiling all this. Karma yoga, for example, which is the <coughs> sorry, Gita's message. Every karma is a divine karma. Every karma. See, Aurobindo expounds it so many details in his essays and Gita. Every work is a divine work. And that is the way to go towards Brahman. So you don't think of going to a cave or to a Himalayas in order to realize Brahman. Because if you go to Himalayas, you may only see Himalayas and not Brahman. Or if you go to a cave, you may see only cave and no Brahman. So be here where you are. And there you realize Brahman, your work, the moment, the work that you are doing. It may be teaching, it may be studying, it may be writing, even it may be grass cutting. It may be beautifying the garden, those people do it. If they realize it as a sacrifice to Brahman, as an offering to Brahman, that will be karma yoga. <laughs> Similarly, those who are engaged in knowledge, different kinds of knowledge, a scientific knowledge, philosophical knowledge, every kind of knowledge. That is the Jnana Yoga. Jnana doesn't mean only Brahma Jnana. Of course, it means Brahma Jnana. But Brahma Jnana means every knowledge, every form of knowledge is Brahma Jnana. If you know the little details of this mic, for example, this speaker, if you know the details, you know Brahman really. Because Brahman sits in the details, not devil. Devil is not the details. It is Brahman who is in the details. So that is the way we can say that is Jnana Yoga. Bhakti, Bhakti has a tremendous, uh, magnificent uh, uh, meaning. It can be Bhakti of any kind. Ishwar Bhakti is not the only Bhakti, human Bhakti. Bhakti for the parents is no less divine. Similarly, love for animals is no less divine. Love for human beings is no less divine. So in that sense, Bhakti Yoga can also take us to Brahman. So, uh, before I uh, really conclude, because uh, we'll have some discussion and that will uh, another time, time is there. Okay. So, uh, this is how Sri Aurobindo is telling us that <coughs> Brahman can be. Uh, oh, it is here, here. Yeah, it is here. Sorry, sorry. I need not depend on that. So, Sri Aurobindo is really giving new meaning to these concepts. Jnana, Bhakti, Karma, these are the old concepts. Our tradition is rich with meaning of these concepts. And different systems have developed these concepts in different ways. See how Gita has been understood in different ways. Whereas Tilak says, Karma Yoga is prevalent, pre preeminent in the Gita. Somebody else may say it is Bhakti which is preeminent. Somebody, Sankracharya says it is. It is Jnana which is preeminent. But Sri Aurobindo accepts none of this. He says, every yoga is prominent. Every yoga, every system of yoga is prominent. So there is no question of any 
priority, superiority, inferiority. Therefore, he talks of a synthesis of yogas. All yogas are to be synthesized in the sense they constitute a holistic, holistic framework. How to take us from ourselves to the divine, from the finite to the infinite, from the true untruth to the truth, from the death to immortality. That is the famous Brihadaranya uh, Kopanishad sloka that we have to go from death to immortality. Now, these aspirations for human beings will be achieved according to Sri Aurobindo only if we take all the aspects of human reality into account. And that really brings in the idea of integration of the human nature. Human nature itself has to be integrated because the thinking faculty, the physical aspect of human reality, all are part of the same being. So the distinction between body and mind doesn't is involved in body, and body is the very primus of every kind of evolution. So in that sense, uh, our physical being is also a mental being, and our mental being is also a supramental being. So what is the gap between mind and the supermind? It is a matter of realization. The gap is a gap of realization. There is no antique gap between mind and supermind, but there is only a matter of experiential uh, effort. The gap is in experience. We do not experience mind as supermind. But if we experience mind as supermind, then we can reach supramental consciousness. So the supramental consciousness, of course, he says it will descend. But descend from where? So we can ask, what is this descent? Does it come from the sky? No, he is not talking of a sky from which it comes. Brahman is not in the sky. Brahman is here. It is in us, but we have to realize it. So that he calls the descent. So descent of Brahman into matter. And matter ascends to Brahman. So the ascent and descent process takes place within our own consciousness. So ultimately it is in and through consciousness that we can realize the supramental consciousness. And that is the way we can realize Brahman. If realize, this realization is possible, then life divine or divine life is possible. Now the last question which I must address, and that is uh, a key point. Is it individual transformation of consciousness that he is talking about? Is he talking about some kind of a individual salvation as we thought earlier? Am I only concerned with my own liberation? This question has been raised. So many have thought that the liberation is so individual that whether he attends liberation or not has nothing to do with the society itself. So society is left out, and the man is in such a for his own salvation. So there is the gap between the individual and the society. Sri Aurobindo wants to bridge the gap between the individual and society. If the society is not liberated, how can I be liberated? If the society doesn't have happiness, how can I be happy alone? Is my happiness possible if society around me is not happy? If society around me is not spiritual, can I become spiritual? If society around me doesn't have any realization of the divinity, can I become a realized person? So Siyarabinda says that it is not only Jivan Mukti that I want, it is the Jivan Mukti of a whole race. The whole society must have Jivan Mukti. That means we must think of a society which is a society of superman. And that word superman may uh, look slightly uh, uh, puzzling, but it means one who has the realization of the supra consciousness, supra mental consciousness is superman. A superman is one who will be searching for harmony establishing harmony within himself and outside himself. That means the society must be so congenially reconstituted, reformulated, that it can give rise to a race of self-realized, Brahman-realized persons. So my Jivan Mukti must be co-terminus 
or simultaneous with the Jivan Mukti of others. So how is this possible that if I become Jivan Mukta, the others must be Jivan Mukta? Either I must try to make him Jivan Mukta or there is a simultaneous realization of Jivan Mukti. This will, this will be possible, like for example, if you have a Sangha, like in the Buddhist <coughs> tradition, we have a Sangha. Why the Sangha was established? A Sangha is, is established to, to make everybody capable of Nirvana. Everybody gets Nirvana. Therefore, it's a Sangha of the uh, people having Nirvana. That means the uh, Sangha of the Arhatas or the Sangha of the Buddhas. So in that sense, Yorobinda believes that no more we can talk of the liberation of individual self. It must be a collective and collective self or the, the whole national self at a certain level or this whole human self, if you say, the whole human race must aspire for the divine life. If this aspiration can be established on a larger scale, on a grand passive scale, then the idea of a supramental consciousness will be uh, will be meaningful. So the idea of a supramental descent, which he talked about, and he said supramental uh, superman, super mind has descended to earth. He meant that it has descended into his own consciousness and his fellow men's consciousness. That is why the concept of a Aurobhil that he established, or which was established inspired by his ideology, Aurobhil is also the city of the dawn, the city of the divinely inspired people, the people who can aspire for uh, a spiritual power or spiritual life. So, to summarize, what did Sarabinda's philosophy really means for us? Where do we go from here? If somebody is doing research on Sarabindo, there is a definite way of saying to find out the meaning of supermind and the meaning of superman, because that is his central message for the future of humanity. How do you go for, from this age to the future age, age of the supramental beings? Then one can really investigate the different ways in which we can really think about it. So the the message of Sri Aurobindo is that don't be forgetful of what humankind has achieved so far, how human race has really glorified itself with so many achievements, but at the same time, human race has also failed to establish a peaceful and harmonious society. If this is the case, then it is all the more necessary why we must try to bring about a change within ourselves, a transformation of our consciousness. So Sri Aurobindo's philosophy is not only an evolutionary philosophy, not only an integral philosophy, but also a transformative philosophy. Philosophy is for transformation. In fact, it is Marx who said in some context that philosophy is not to contemplate, but to change. I think Sri Aurobindo will endorse it, that only thinking about Brahman will not do, we must try to become Brahman. Thinking about consciousness must, uh, will not do. We must try to change our consciousness. So this change of consciousness, this transformation of the human nature, human mind, and human consciousness is the ultimate goal of an Aurobindian philosophy. So philosophy for Sri Aurobindo is to change the world. And as long as this change is not possible, philosophy, philosophy must continue to strive after this change. So let us uh, conclude by saying that we must, whenever possible, study Sri Aurobindo and also raise questions about these ideas, because that is what philosophy at a certain level means. We must question them. We must think about them. By questioning only, we can bring out new ideas. OK, with these words, I thank all of you for a present hearing. Thank you so much.
in few hours we have almost revised whole philosophy of sri arvindo <laughs> very vastly you have thrown light on uh, different aspects of sri arvindo's philosophy i think that all you have enriched with this uh, lecture that has been given by professor pradhan if still you are having some questions you can ask students My name is Alok Narayan. I am a research scholar in this department. So, sir, I had a question. Uh, when you started your lecture, in the very starting, you said like uh, uh, in the problem of being and becoming. So, uh, you stated that uh, uh, Sri Aurobindo, when uh, starting his spiritual journey, he taken for he had taken for granted the very concept of Brahma. Uh, which is there, uh, which was inspired by Vedantic traditions. So, the, my question is when we sir, readily assume and take for granted the very existence of Brahma, so how on earth one is going to do a spiritual inquiry if it is already presupposed? Okay, so, so it is uh, my submission that any spiritual journey, so to speak, uh, if it started from a traditional or a philosophical system, let's say, I mean, Vedantic tradition or any well. So how can the very inquiry in the search for truth is unbiased and out of the dogmas and principles of the very philosophical system and tradition, uh, one is uh, uh, ascended to uh, or one is going to adhere to, okay? So because one has already predetermined uh, where one would go. So any kind of, yes, in that way. Thank you. Uh, yes, so see, when you go somewhere, we have to accept a goal. Unless there is a goal, your going will not make any sense. So for before the journey, you must set a goal. Now, I think your suggestion is if Brahman is the ultimate reality and Brahman is already within us, so we have taken it for granted. So there is nothing new in it. You can say there is nothing in it new in it. But see, Aurobindo is searching for the new, really. Becoming is that process of getting something new. If Brahman is ultimate reality, if that is the final truth, then there is no newness about it. That newness is, is coming from how we know Brahman or how we realize Brahman. So even if we accept the tradition, we accept the text, let's say we have Manana on the tradition, then when it comes to Nididhyasana, when you have to meditate on it, then the becoming, the journey really starts. Journey doesn't start with Shravana, that is the dogma, that is the text. It's, it doesn't, uh, uh, yes, it also even doesn't start with Manana, it really starts in a sense, but in the Nididhyasana, in the repeated meditation, the journey starts. So spiritual becoming is also a journey. So, so in a sense, Sri Aurobindo's philosophy is not a journey of not only a journey of man to the uh, Brahman, but also it is a journey of every individual being towards Brahman. So I don't think if Brahman is our goal, everything is not complete, everything is not finished. I may be away from Brahman, thus as we are all very away from God or Brahman, uh, but we have not started the journey. So by starting the journey, you get the new experience, new levels of consciousness, new, new level of consciousness called Supermind. So in that sense only, you can get the new development uh, by starting the journey. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Ma'am, uh, can any online participant ask the question? This is Rajan. Uh, 
Yeah, if you allowed me. Uh, this is Rajan. Uh, I wanted to ask. I'm an online participant. Please, Am I yeah, audible, Ashish? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. And uh, we all could see the sadhana which Professor Pradhan has done while consolidating the whole philosophy of Syria. Being a preliminary reader of Syria Windows philosophy, I face certain challenges that I want to you know, express here. I have two metaphors uh, which I want to express. The first metaphor is uh, which I uh, assume uh, might not be very logical, but I'm take it, taking it. You know, during winter, uh, when snake uh, set it, and when in the winter it, it uh, sacrifices it, you know, will we call it snake or we will call it a, a, a mere waste? So, in the same manner, if Brahman is the sun and this world. Uh, we consider that sort of skin will be still be calling it a real thing. That is the real challenge which uh, arises with Sri Aurobindo. And I think Professor Anand Mishra is there. He has written recently a paper that published in Sandhana. He has argued for the fact that although Sri Aurobindo rejects the idea of Maya, and based on this thesis, he is not basically an advaiting. So my first challenge is that. Uh, that uh, which I also personally face is that that Maya in itself is a fact that we all have to accept. Based on this thing, somehow Sir Bindo's philosophy of uh, you know affirming the idea of practical world is somehow very much you know problematic. This is one thing. This is one metaphor, and the second metaphor, which might not be a very logical thing to say in a public domain but i am just i just want to express imagine there is an individual uh, in the winter who does not take bath and he uh, due to laziness or due to the pleasure and he or she grows some parasites or you know uh, bacterias on his body or her body and then looks into the fact that they all are fighting with one another and they are you know eating each other i'm just referring it to the idea of problem of evil you know when we are talking about the practicality of the world and uh, taking it into the sense that uh, uh, brahman is the reality we cannot imagine brahman to be a sadist kind of you know phenomenon so based on these two metaphors i feel that sri aurobindo's philosophy does not explain the whole of the thing on the one hand we face that this world is a sort of maya because uh, somehow we have to sacrifice the waste uh, whether it is body or whatever and then realize the truth and the second one is that we are not able to express uh, explain the idea of problem of evil which we face in the world in any form so how would you see it so that i can you know uh, explain to other leaders of sri aurobindo thank you so much Uh, I think it was not a question. It was his explanation or his reflection of Sri Aurobind. So uh, much of it uh, went out of my grasp precisely because it is from a distance. Uh, the point uh, that we have tried to struggle, it is not that Aurobindo has given the final word. It is we can also find a final word if we can really, really find. The question is not whether he has finally solved it or not, but he has tried to solve it without taking the help of Maya. Though he has not given up the concept of Maya, but he has interpreted in such a way that it doesn't fit into our convent, uh, uh, our official Maya Vada. So in that sense, he has divert, uh, digressed uh, from the uh, traditional Mayavad. Now, when we say the world is real, are we saying something untrue? But if I say the world is unreal, I am saying untrue. I am becoming uh, really the, uh, the philosopher of the traditional kind. 
means I can refute anything that common sense uh, denies. That will not make any philosophy palatable. So Sri Aurobindo says this world is real. Everything is real. You are real. Why are you saying you are unreal? What will you get by saying you are unreal? But the question is how you become real. He is solving that question. You become real because this is the process of the universe itself. You become real because the universe is real. And you become real because there is evolutionary process. Mother nature is evolving you. And as he suggests, mother nature itself could not have evolved if Brahman would not have directed it. So the Sankhya Purusha in Sri Aurobindo's uh, terminology is still active. It is not a passive Purusha that he wants, an active Purusha who really guides the whole process of the universe. And that is the explanation that he gives. So there is uh, anybody who wants to get greater details, I advise to read the life divide. Without reading that, any offhand remark will not make any sense. OK, thank you. Sami Guru Jalaku Mirabam, myself Avay Rajado, and I want to ask my question in Hindi. Uh, sir, when we read the Ved and Upanishad, there is a hierarchy of deities in the deities. There is a hierarchy of deities. Brahma, Ishwar, and different kinds of deities. Uh, for example, Jal Deta, Vaid Deta. इंस्टीट्यूशन पर देखते हैं इसमें भी एक हाइरार्की है राष्ट्रपति का पद है प्राइम मिनिस्टर का पद है उनके नीचे डिफरेंट काइंड ऑफ मिनिस्टर्स तो जो साइंटिफिक टेम्परामेंट का होता है और यदि इस भौतिक जगत में उसे जल से या फिर वित्तीय संसाधनों से कोई प्रॉब्लम होती है तो वह इस लौकिक जगत में उस समस्या का समाधान ढूंढने का प्रयास करता है लेकिन जो व्यक्ति रिलीजियस टेम्परामेंट का होता है यदि उसे इन सब से रिलेटेड समस्याएं होती हैं, तो वो अलौकिक वर्ड में इन सबका समस्याओं का समाधान ढूंढने का प्रयास करता है वो जब बारिश नहीं होती है तो किसान कहता है कि एक भगवान ईश्वर जो कोई भी हो बारिश करो आ, हम आपको हवी देंगे ये दे, कुछ भी देंगे तो माई क्वेश्चन इज दैट कि आपने कहा कि दिस वर्ड इज मैनिफेस्टेशन ऑफ ब्रह्मा तो मेरा क्वेश्चन ये है कि क्या हम ये नहीं कह सकते कि ब्रह्मा इज द इमेजिनेशन ऑफ दिस पीपल Man, if it doesn't bring light, that cannot see what's light, or that cannot 
Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, since Dr. Rajiva is waiting since long, uh, so um, I invite you to ask your question. And after then, Dr. Arlok Tandon, one of the very serious uh, uh, researchers in the uh, philosophical world. So after Dr. Rajiva, Dr. Arlok Tandon will ask question. Excuse me, my dear students. Pranam, sir. Thank you so much for your thought-provoking and informative talk. I don't have any question, but I have one particular doubt that is about liberation or attainment of liberation or experience of liberation. When we uh, consider that, uh, or wh whether we can consider mind is possible without a soul or not, if we consider it is possible, then perhaps matter have also soul and matter are liberated matters are related and also if we deny it then we will also we have to grant it that matter doesn't have mind or soul so matters are not related so it's my doubt thank you sir yeah um, yes that is a question which uh,
So that is the central question which we raised, whether uh, uh, matter itself has mind or not. If we do not accept matter-mind division, which we generally don't accept, unless we are Cartesians, uh, we definitely say that matter is there where mind is there. But Sri Aurobindo goes as forward, a step forward. He says mind and matter are no co not co-terminus. Mind is inbuilt into matter. That is the point which scientists may disagree. And that is majority of the modern uh, materialists will say, oh, that is humbug. How can mind be in matter? So they are diametrically opposite of each other. But his point is that unless mind is there in matter, how can from matter mind evolve? See, unless something is there, that is our Satkarya Bhada in Indian philosophy. Unless the effect is pre-existent in cause, how can there be any produce production of the effect? Satkarya Bhada. That's why, you know, great Satkarya Vadins have refuted Asatkarya Bhada or the so-called Arambha Bhada. Because you cannot have any Arambha or beginning unless there is a base. So Sri Aurobindo is appeal to, appealing to Satkarya Vada and saying that the effect must be pre-existent in the cause. So if mind is the effect, if consciousness is the effect, it cannot be superficial to the mind, uh, to the matter. It must be inbuilt into matter. So that is to suggest that mind is involved in matter. His notion of involution. So we have to accept that if there is a mind in matter, then in certain rudimentary form, any material object can have the potentiality of becoming a mental object. So that is the solution that uh, uh, Aurobindo offers. And that is very much intelligible in the human self itself. If we say our brain produces consciousness, which the materialists say, but actually unless consciousness is built into the brain, unless consciousness is Unless the brain is conscious, it cannot produce consciousness. So in that sense, consciousness must be in the brain or in the physical body. And then only it can give rise to consciousness in a developed form. That is the process of evolution. OK, thank you. Sir, may I ask my question? Whether you are present, you can listen us. Dr. Alok Tandon, kindly ask your question, please. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Professor Pradhan, for giving us a very, especially for me, an outsider to Arvindo's philosophy, a very concise and very uh, clear cut uh, exposition of his thoughts. But suddenly it came to my mind that uh, though I, a question from outside, outsider, uh, that why there was a need for Brahman to identify itself with finite. Why infinite chose to identify itself with finite? This is one question. Second one uh, comes to my mind that if Brahman was freely uh, choosing the to identify itself with finite, why not it did the whole evolutionary process in one go? Why did it not create the superman or superman at once? Why was the need for evolution? And the third question, this just came to my mind when you were talking about the difference between the materialist and the idealist. Now the naturalist, they ex accept that consciousness emerges in the brain, though they are not able to clearly identify the process. But once we accept that consciousness emerges in the brain through a natural and material process, is there any need for divine consciousness in it to explain? And given the fact that human beings are fighting among themselves, a lot of violence we are seeing, war, communal violence and all that, how can we think of evolution? Are we not going back, back to animal man or to superman? Thank you.
So, yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Tandon. Uh, these are very pointed philosophical questions, and uh, uh, really they are challenging questions, not only for me, but uh, anybody who is defending Sri Aurobindo. Uh, I am in the uh, position of the advocate, not of not devil, but advocate of Sri Aurobindo. Okay, so why Brahman, if it is self complete, if it is Punna, uh, really wanted to be finite? Why Brahman, who is infinite, becomes finite? What a queer uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of choice uh, Brahman has. Uh, the question is really uh, perturbing to anybody because unless you are in deep sympathy with Sarabinda, you will find the this question is so uh, really so difficult to answer. Now he says it is Brahman's will. It is the divine will to manifest itself in the finite form. Perhaps in plain and simple terms, it will be that Brahman, the, the uh, infinite reality, has become finite reality. It is not because of our mind that it appears as finite. That is a big difference here. It is not because of our mind that Brahman appears as finite. That will be the mental illusion. And that will be the real Maya in the traditional sense. But Brahman, in his whole full capacity of the will, chooses to become finite. Of course, I am uh, sure that it will not convince anybody because uh, uh, will have a choice. Is Brahman a human being? Is he have a will like us? Of course, uh, Brahman is not a human being, not a superhuman being. So uh, Brahman, if we say Brahman is Ananta, if is Brahman is Ananta, can he not assimilate Anta, that is finitude? Is Brahman, the infinity of Brahman is so limited that it cannot enclose and compass finite? That is the way we can understand. Imagine the infinite consciousness encompasses the finite consciousness. I am a finite consciousness, you are a finite consciousness. Who involves us together? Who takes us into one grasp? And that is the infinite consciousness. So we cannot deny to infinite Brahman the capacity to manifest itself in the finite world. Perhaps that is the way a philosopher is trying to explain that this material world, which is finite, is not very different from the infinite world, infinite Brahman. Maybe it is part of that. Maybe it is already contained in it. As to the second question of uh, Dr. Tandon, it is very important. Why? Why evolution? Why not a sudden jump? I will request uh, 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 Dr. Tannan to ask these questions out to, to Darwin also. Why not suddenly man became, animal became man? See, man, the animals from the uh, small organisms to bigger organisms, it took a long millennium, millions of years to evolve. That is the true process of natural selection. Anyway, nature has evolved through a different process. How can it there be a sudden jump? If it is a sudden jump, then it will be a magical universe. Only in a magical universe, you can say suddenly it becomes a man becomes a superman. No, it is not possible in the real universe. Man has to struggle to become a superman. No, no, without, no, uh, without any effort, man cannot become a superman. So evolution is the necessity of for understanding any progressive universe. If you believe that the universe is regressing, it is a regressive universe, then perhaps you don't require a theory of evolution. If you think everything is already finished, everything is uh, really completed, the process is completed, either by sudden chance or by some kind of a divine grace, then evolution will not be possible. But there is no divine grace so far as man's becoming Superman or the world becoming a divinely uh, possible world is not a sudden uh, kind of development. It requires really tremendous effort and evolution is that the result. As to the last question, if uh, last question, I forgot this. Yeah, the last question was uh, yeah. Uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Chandan, will you please repeat your last, last question? Last question in a simple yeah, way. Just please. remind me. 
Uh, uh, this, this, the last question was uh, perhaps about the violence. And, oh, uh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, exactly. That is the most uh, troubling question to me and to everybody. If the world is full of violence, the world is full of uh, conflict, human, man, conflict, man, man, conflict, man, animal, conflict, man, matter, conflict. We are no less elemental to our mountains and rivers. If you extend the concept of life to mountain and rivers, they have also life. But we are their greatest enemies. We devastate them, we destroy them. So the world is full of what Aurobindo will say, a twilight region of the universe. This is the Sandhya Khan. Full of conflict we are facing. We are our own extinction is a distinct possibility. If tomorrow a third world war arises, we do not know where we will be. Perhaps our extinction will be our highest possibility. But this is such a kind of scenario. Sri Aurobindo is the last philosopher to be pessimistic. He says future of man is as bright as the past was. We had dark ages. We have overcome them. We have the age of rationality. And if we have come to the age of rationality and reason, we can solve our problems. Even war has been solved. The war is not eternal war. It is not a perpetual war. So someday war will come to an end. But man is trying to find out the means of solving the problem. This is reason. But beyond this also, we can think of when man will not raise any war at all. When man will not start a war on land. Because this is the prime uh, cause of wars. Land is the cause. Somebody predicted that future wars will be for water. We have not come to that level. Water is still there on earth. So future wars may be what they are. But if Sarabindo's thinking is right, then he thinks that it is better to think it positively that the future will be more peaceful than the present. Let us not lose uh, the possibility of peace in the name of the present actuality of war. The possibility of peace cannot be sacrificed for the actuality of war. So that will be his uh, suggestion that let us think in a better way, in a more uh, brighter way about the future. Yes, yeah. OK, thank you, Dr. Uh, uh Thank you very much, sir, for making us I... so optimistic about the conditions of the war. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Prakash, there will be no end of questions at all. The desire to listen to him is increasing more and more. <laughs> but I have to, we have to look forward also. And uh, uh, well, uh, as uh, uh, today's session's president. Uh, okay, fine. This, uh, this, this will be the last question, please, because as we have to uh, go forward also. Fine. Fine, ask your question. Come. Uh, yes, my name is Francesca. And uh, I have a question related to the level of consciousness. You were talking about Brahman and you were explaining the level of consciousness. Uh, that was very nice explained in your book, Metaphysics of Consciousness, which it is also a Vedantic perspective. Uh, actually, when we are talking about the level of consciousness, you were used the terms self and the terms society. Uh, I guess at the super level of consciousness, we cannot talk anymore about the society. I guess there is everybody, it's only one, no, it is oneness, it is self. Until which level of consciousness we actually can talk about the society? Because I guess when we are reaching at the level of understanding Brahman, at the super consciousness, it is only oneness, everybody is one. Okay, yes. Francisca, thank you. And uh, I must thank you for your very good questions she sent to my mail after reading my book. So she is really very, uh, she is enthusiastic about uh, Indian philosophy. And I admire her uh, interest in Indian philosophy. Yes, you are right. At the higher level of consciousness, we 
uh, realize the unity of everything. But remember, it is a unity of everybody. So there must be everybody to realize the unity. That means all of us will be there, and yet we believe we are all one. So by realizing oneness of reality, or oneness of our, all ourselves, we do not abolish the individuality. You remain Francisca, I remain Ramesh, and yet we can feel that we are one in being conscious of a higher kind. This is possible. This is humanly possible. In fact, the uh, many other philosophies try to say we have empathy, we have sympathy, we have compassion. But Sri Aurobindo goes further. He says mere sympathy will not do. You have to feel oneness with the other. And oneness is a greater concept than mere sympathy or mere compassion. So feeling oneness with the other, that is the great message of Vedanta. Advaita has been trying to say this, that we are all one self. And we must realize that we are all one, because we are all Brahman. But that doesn't mean that we are really rejecting diversity. So society will be there. That will be a superhuman society. Let us imagine that glorious future. Superhuman society. But there will be individuals. Individuality is not dissolved. But all individuals will feel that they belong to one reality, that they all realize the oneness which pervades all around. So thank you so much for your nice question. Uh, Simi, would you like to ask some question? OK. Dr. Simi. Pranam, sir. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Actually, I was wondering that how you love to articulate all the philosophy of Sri Aurobindo in this particular time. Anyway, I just want to know about the divine concept, the divine Maya. Uh, you are uh, just uh, speaking about that. Uh, obviously, there's a difference between the Advaita concept of Maya, Sri Shankaracharya's concept of Maya. So I'm just uh, thinking about, uh, is there any um, re relation between uh, Sri Ramanuja's concept of Maya? Because uh, he is explaining through the Anubhavati, Maya is real. Obviously, Shankaracharya also explaining Maya is real, but uh, it has uh, some differences. So uh, the matching of uh, Sri Aurobindo and uh, Sri Ramanuja, is there any way? And another question also I want to ask you. Um, is there anything unreal in Sri Aurobindo? Concept of unreal? Unreal. unreal. Thank you so oh, much, sir. Yeah, thank you. Nice yeah, nice question. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, there is a difference between the concept of Maya in Advaita, that is Sankracharya Advaita, and Sri Aurobindo's concept of Maya. He has the, used the word divine Maya. So, Maya in the divine sense, he accepts. Maya in the mental sense, he rejects. The mental Maya is our projection. And he has little respect for the mental projections. So superimposition will be our, our mental construct. We super, superimpose the world on Brahman. So that is superimposition or dust. So that doesn't, uh, it doesn't appeal to Sri Aurobindo. He doesn't say that the world is imposed on Brahman. Rather, he says the world, the Brahman has appeared, uh, Brahman has manifested itself as Brahman. Sorry, Brahman as the world. That means. Brahman. So the concept of unreal for him can only be restricted to our imaginary things. The mentally constructed imaginary things could be unreal. But there is no unreality in the massive sense, unreality in the uh, in the transcendental sense. You cannot say the world is unreal. So you cannot, he has hardly appealed to the Raju Sattva Nyaya, as you know, the snake uh, rope illusion. He has hardly uh, talked about it because he thinks it is only explaining uh, our ignorance in a mental level. So the unreality will be there as long as some kind of ignorance persists. 
for example in ignorance we can always uh, say that the universe is uh, unreal in ignorance we can say because we do not know the brahman world identity so even if it is unreal accepted it is at the level of mind so at the supramental level there will be nothing unreal okay thank you Uh, thank you very much. As I have told earlier that uh, there will be no end of questions now, but we will have to <laughs> go forward. Now it's a time for presidential remarks. Uh, therefore, I request Professor Rasi Pandey, sir, to deliver his lecture. Thank you. Bhavani Shankarau Vande Shraddha Vishwas Rupinau Yavyam Binana Pashyanti Siddha Swantastamishwaram Bande Bodhmayam Nityam Gurum Shankar Rupinam Yama Shraddha Vakru Apichandra Sharvatra Vandyate Om Shanti 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 Dais Par Bethe Aaj Ke Mukhi Vyakta Aur Bade Bhai Professor Pradhanji, Vivaga Dhyaksh Professor Anandji, Sanchalika Shruti Ji, and in this Sabhagar, we sit with our Sahyogi Adhyapak Brind, and with our Sahyogi Adhyapak Brind, and with our Sahyogi Mitra, Chhatra Kshatrao, Bhai Behno, इस उत्तम व्याख्यान के लिए सबसे पहले तो मैं प्रोफेसर प्रधान जी को मैं धन्यवाद देता हूं कुछ बड़ी अजीब स्थिति मेरे सामने इसलिए है कि बड़े भाई कुछ कह गए और छोटे भाई को अध्यक्षता दे दी गई कितना कठिन समय होता है बड़े के सामने बोलना ये आप महसूस कर सकते हैं और वह भी तब जब श्रुति जी ने प्रयोग किया एक शब्द का अध्यक्षीय संबोधन जो बोधन वक्ता नहीं कर पाए उसका संबोधन अध्यक्ष कर पाएगा ये बड़ा कठिन है लेकिन श्री दर्शन पर जो मुख्य बातें प्रोफेसर प्रधान जी ने कही यद्यपि पूरे के पूरे श्री दर्शन को ही आपने उनके जितने सारे बिंदु थे विचार के सबको आपने एक साथ समाहित करने की कोशिश किया और बहुत अच्छे ढंग से आपने बताया और यदि मैं उन सारी बातों को अगर बहुत संक्षेप में मैं कहूं समय की सीमा को देखते हुए तो कभी-कभी ऐसा लगता है कि व्यक्ति का व्यक्तित्व तो उसके कृतित्व में दिखाई देता है और कभी-कभी ऐसा देता दिखाई देता है कि कभी-कभी व्यक्ति का व्यक्तित्व तो कुछ अलग होता है और उसका कृतित्व तो कुछ अलग होता है हम जब श्री अरविंद को देखते हैं तो श्री अरविंद हमको एक अरविंद में तीन तीन श्री अरविंद दिखाई देते हैं और उनकी जो समग्र दृष्टि है उस समग्र दृष्टि के हिसाब से मैं यह बोल रहा हूं कि एक वह अरविंद जो शुद्ध एकेडमिक है एक वह अरविंद जो स्वतंत्रता संग्राम सेनानी है और एक वह अरविंद जो एक आध्यात्मिक दस्ता है एक ही अरविंद में जैसे ये तीन चीजें समग्रीकृत हैं उसी प्रकार से श्री अरविंद के दर्शन के सारे के सारे विचार बिंदु भी एक दूसरे के साथ समग्रीकृत हैं इंटीग्रल हैं और शायद इसीलिए श्रीअरविंद के दर्शन को हम लोग इंटीग्रल अद्वैतीज में कहते भी हैं अद्वैतीज में इसलिए हम कहते हैं क्योंकि प्रोफेसर प्रधान जी ने भी कहा कि श्रीअरविंद का दर्शन उपनिषद पर आधारित है उपनिषद और तंत्र दोनों पर आधारित है क्योंकि मुझे लगता है कि औपनिषदिक विचारों का औपनिषदिक बिंदुओं का जिस प्रकार का विवेचन अद्वैत वेदांत में किया गया और जिस प्रकार की कुछ जिज्ञासाएं अद्वैत वेदांत के साथ रह गई थी श्री अरविंद के दर्शन में आकर उनके तार्किक समाधान की कोशिश की गई और ऐसा भी किया गया कि शंकराचार्य के मायावाद का खंडन भी किया गया ऐसा नहीं कि केवल केवल अद्वैत को स्वीकार किया गया यहां इतना जरूर है कि अद्वैत के पृष्ठभूमि पर समग्र अद्वैतवाद के भवन का निर्माण हुआ है अब उपनिषद के जो तीन 
कथन है एक कथन एकम एवं द्वितीय ब्रह्म सर्वम खल इदम ब्रह्म और अनम ब्रह्मेति व्यजानात ये तीन ऐसे उपनिषद के वाक्य हैं जिन तीन ऊपर उपनिषद के वाक्यों को लेकर के श्री अरविंद ने अपने संपूर्ण दर्शन दर्शन की पीठी का तैयार किया है एकमात्र ब्रह्म एक अद्वितीय ब्रह्म है सब कुछ ब्रह्म है और अन्नम ब्रह्मेति व्यजानात ये तीन के तीन वाक्य श्री अरविंद दर्शन के पूरी की पूरी रेख रूप रेखा हमारे सामने प्रस्तुत करते हैं एकमात्र सत्ता ब्रह्म की है यह जो उपनिषद का स्वीकार्य वाक्य है जो शंकर को भी स्वीकार्य है इसको भी वह मानते हैं लेकिन जब सर्वम खलविदम ब्रह्म कहते हैं तो वह कहते हैं कि यह जगत भी ब्रह्म ही है जो आचार्य शंकर स्वीकार नहीं करते जड़ और चेतन का भेद आचार्य शंकर के दर्शन में है लेकिन श्री अरविंद के दर्शन में वह नहीं है जब वह उपनिषद का वाक्य कोट करके कहते हैं कि अन्न ब्रह्म व्यजाना भौतिक तत्व भी ब्रह्म है तो भौतिक तत्व भी ब्रह्म है या कहकर के या कहकर चित जड़ और चेतन के द्वैत को समाप्त चेतन और द्वैत का जो एक एक, एक शंकराचार्य के दर्शन में चेतन और अचेतन का जो द्वैत है और केवल चेतन की स्वीकृति है श्री अरविंद ने चेतन और अचेतन को एक पृष्ठभूमि पर ला करके और उन्होंने कहा कि चेतन और अचेतन ये दोनों दो नहीं है बल्कि अचेतन चेतन का ही एक रूप है मैटर इज पॉइज ऑफ कॉन्सियसनेस द सेम कॉन्सियसनेस एज एज एब्सोल्यूट हैज मैनिफेस्टेड डिफरेंट इन द डिफरेंट पॉइज ऑफ कॉन्सियसनेस विद डिफरेंट पॉइज ऑफ यू नो वही एक चेतना जो एब्सोल्यूट है वो डिफरेंट पॉइजेस में अपने को मैनिफेस्ट कर रही है जो सच्चितानंद है वह अपने आप को अति मन मन प्राण और प्रश्न पूछा था हमारे मित्र ने कि वो चेतना में जड़ में वो कैसे हो सकता है जड़ में मन कैसे हो सकता है क्योंकि मन का अवतरण हुआ है इसलिए उसमें है वो सच्चितानंद जब ऊपर से जब अवतरित हो रहा है जब इन्वोल्यूशन उसका हो रहा है तो अतिमन मन प्राण के साथ वह मैटर में आ रहा है और इसकी इसलिए यह तार्किक रूप से सही हमको दिखाई देता है क्योंकि अगर ये चीजें उस मैटर में न हो तो शेरविंद शायद मैटर से इवोल्यूशन की कोई व्याख्या नहीं कर पाते ना सते विद्यते भावो ना भावो विद्यते सतह सत का अभाव नहीं हो सकता और जिसका अभाव है वो हो नहीं सकता तो चूंकि वहां सत रूप में वहां है ये चीजें इसीलिए इनका विकास भी संभव हो पाता है अगर इन सारी चीजों को पर्सपेक्टिव में मैं देखो प्रोफेसर प्रधान के पूरे के पूरे अगर मैं लेक्चर को अगर मैं बहुत बहुत छोटे में मैं अगर करने की कोशिश करूं तो आपने मुख्यतः श्री अरविंद के दर्शन के तीन फाउंडेशन आपने बताए हैं एक फाउंडेशन है इंटेग्रल नॉलेज समग्र ज्ञान जिसको हम लोग कहते हैं और वो इसलिए क्योंकि उपनिषद की परंपरा जहां या कहती है कि ब्रह्म को हम नहीं जान सकते नैशा तर्क मतिरापनैया जतो वाचो निवर्त अंत और प्राप्य मनसा सह हम नहीं जान सकते तर्क से नहीं जान सकते मन से नहीं जान सकते बुद्धि से नहीं जान सकते शेरविंद कहते हैं कि ऐसा नहीं है एब्सोल्यूट इज अनोन बट नॉट अनोएबुल शब्द का वो प्रयोग कर रहे हैं लाइफ डिवाइन कहते हैं कि वह अनोन तो है एब्सोल्यूट इज अनोन फॉर अवर लिमिटेड रीजन बिकॉज अवर लिमिटेड रीजन इज बेस्ड ऑन बेस्ड ऑन लाफ एक्सक्लूडेड मिडिल हमारी जो बुद्धि है वो लाफ एक्सक्लूडेड मिडिल पर आधारित है हमारी इस बुद्धि से वो अनोन अभी अनोन तो है लेकिन इसका नहीं किट विल रिमेन अनोन अगर ऐसा कह दिया जाए तो पूरे के पूरे शास्त्र की वह पूरे के पूरे शास्त्र का वह प्रयोजन ही खत्म हो जाएगा जहां हम कहते हैं कि लेटेस्ट नो रियालिटी नो दाई सेल्फ ये पूरी की पूरी यह जो वाक्य है यह वाक्य ही हमारे यहां से समाप्त हो जाएगा अगर हम इसको न स्वीकार करें कि उसको हम जान सकते हैं तो श्री अरविंद का सबसे बड़ा एक कंट्रीब्यूशन यह है कि वो इंटीग्रल नॉलेज की बात जब वो करते हैं तो उसमें यह स्थापित करने की कोशिश करते हैं कि एब्सोल्यूट इज अनोन बट नॉट अनुएबल वो अब वह अज्ञात है लेकिन अज्ञे नहीं दूसरा है हम उसको कैसे जान सकते हैं टू नो रियलिटी श्री अरविंद है प्रपोज लॉजिक ऑफ इनफाइनाइट रियलिटी को हम कैसे जान सकते हैं तो उन्होंने लॉजिक ऑफ इनफाइनाइट को प्रपोज किया एंड व्हाट इज लॉजिक ऑफ इनफाइनाइट चेयरमिंद कहते हैं कि व्हाट अपीयर्स मैजिक टू अस दैट इज द लॉजिक ऑफ इनफाइनाइट फॉर व्हाट अपीयर्स मैजिक टू अस दैट इज द लॉजिक ऑफ इनफाइनाइट ये इनफाइनाइट लॉजिक क्या है जो हमको जादू प्रतीत होता है वही इनफाइनाइट लॉजिक है क्योंकि 
फाइनाइट रीजन से हम जब इन फाइनाइट को नहीं पकड़ पाते हैं तो हमारी एक तार्किक बाध्यता होती है कि इन फाइनाइट को पकड़ने के लिए हमको फाइनाइट रीजन से ऊपर जाना होगा उसको ट्रांसिडेंट करना होगा और तब जाकर के हम उसको पा सकते हैं और वह जो विधि होगी वो इन फाइनाइट की विधि होगी दिस इज दन कंट्रीब्यूशन ऑफ सिरो इन दिलोसफी इंडियन फिलोसफी दैट ही प्रपोज लॉजिक ऑफ इन फाइनाइट टू नो द रियलिटी एंड नाउ दर्ड इज इवोल्यूशन Which is the very, which is very important in Sri Aurobindo's philosophy. Aurobindo is a kind of darshanik, who is avatarang ko vikas ke roop me le rahe hai. Darwinian vikas ki theory hai, kaisi vikas ki theory hai, jo niche se upar ko kewal vikas ko manti hai ki wo niche se upar ko vikas hota hai, protoplasma se dhire 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 vikas hota hai. Lekin Sri Aurobindo is the only philosophy who considered evolution as a evolution, evolution as a evolution of the world. Involution is the evolution of the uh, of this world, and this world is real because of it is the involu it is involu it is involution or it is the manifestation of the same reality. Since reality is true, then the world is true because it is manifestation of that same reality. इसीलिए शेरबिंद जगत को सत्य मानते हैं क्योंकि वह सत्य की अभिव्यक्ति है. Manifestation का मतलब ही होता है कि वह जिस रूप में है उसी रूप में अभिव्यक्त कर सकता है. और जहां तक मुझे याद है प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर टंडन जी ने जो एक प्रश्न पूछा था कि ऐसा क्यों करता है क्यों नहीं वह जल्दी से कर देता है काल ऑफ सडन कर देता शेरविंद कहते हैं कि नहीं ऐसा नहीं करता वो क्यों क्योंकि एब्सोल्यूट इज नॉट कंडीशन वो बाध्य नहीं है एब्सोल्यूट इज नॉट क्रिएशन फॉर एब्सोल्यूट इज नॉट कंडीशन फॉर इवोल्यूशन ये उसकी स्वतंत्रता है ये स्वतंत्रता शब्द ला करके श्री अरविंद ने तंत्र को यहां ला करके प्रवेश कराया है श्री अरविंद के एब्सोल्यूट में ये जो स्वतंत्रता शब्द है ये तंत्र का शब्द है और इस तंत्र शब्द को ला करके उन्होंने क्रिएशन को क्रिएशन को एब्सोल्यूट के साथ जोड़ा है और जोड़ करके उन्होंने कहा है कि ये जो सच्चित आनंद है उसमें सत्य जो है वह जगत का अधिष्ठान है दैट इज दाउंडेशन ऑफ वर्ल्ड और जो चित है वह कॉन्सियसनेस फोर्स है और सबसे बड़ी टंडन जी के प्रश्न का उत्तर यहां आता है कि यह जो कॉन्सियसनेस फोर्स है उसके पास तीनों शक्तियां हैं इनफाइनाइट सेल्फ वेरिएशन इनफाइनाइट सेल्फ लिमिटेशन और इनफाइनाइट सेल्फ एब्जॉर्बन वो तीनों के लिए वो तीनों प्रयोग करने के लिए वो स्वतंत्र है और सबसे बड़ी बात यह है कि शेरविंद अपने ढंग से औपनिषदिक वाक्यों का अर्थ भी करते हैं शेरविंद के लिए स्वतंत्रता केवल स्वतंत्र होने की स्वतंत्रता नहीं है अरविंद के लिए स्वतंत्रता जितनी स्वतंत्र होने के लिए स्वतंत्रता है उतनी ही परतंत्र होने के लिए भी स्वतंत्रता है ऐसा कोई स्वतंत्र जो केवल स्वतंत्र होने के लिए स्वतंत्र हो और परतंत्र होने के लिए स्वतंत्र न हो वो स्वतंत्र नहीं हो सकता और श्री अरविंद इसी लॉजिक से कहना चाह रहे हैं कि वो एब्सोलूट स्वतंत्र है वेदर ही चाहे वो क्रिएशन करे चाहे न करे ये उसकी लीला है वही खेल है वही खेल का मैदान है और वही खेल का आनंद लेने वाला भी ये श्री अरविंद को शेरबिंद दर्शन को पढ़ने के लिए शेरबिंद दर्शन को समझने के लिए बहुत सारी टर्मोलॉजीज है जिन टर्मोलॉजीज को हमको समझना होता है इवोल्यूशन इवोल्यूशन के बारे में भी शेरबिंद ने कहा टंडन जी ने जो प्रश्न पूछा कि क्यों नहीं तुरंत हो जाता है शेरबिंद तो साफ कहते हैं कि इवोल्यूशन दो प्रकार से होता है एक कॉस्मिक इवोल्यूशन है और एक इंडिविजुअल इवोल्यूशन है कॉस्मिक इवोल्यूशन को भी शेरबिंद स्वीकार करते हैं जो एक प्रकार से अगर मैं कहूँ थोड़े से थोड़े की थियोरी कहते हैं कि हमें उसमें कोई दिक्कत नहीं है सब चीजें विकसित हो रही है मगर वो जा कहा रही है ये इवोल्यूशन जाएगा कहा पूरे के पूरे यूनिवर्स का इवोल्यूशन हो रहा है ये कहा जाएगा इसका कोई लक्ष्य है इसका कोई अंत है और इंडिविजुअल इवोल्यूशन को भी कह रहे हैं कि इंडिविजुअल इवोल्यूशन भी होता है व्यक्ति का लेकिन इंडिविजुअल इवोल्यूशन जो होता है वो किस लेवल से होता है और क्यों होता है यह भी श्री अरविंद बताते हैं इवोल्यूशन इन इंडिविजुअल इवोल्यूशन से भी हमको वही मिलेगा जो कॉस्मिक इवोल्यूशन जहां जाएगा क्योंकि बेसिकली ये इंडिविजुअल और कॉस्मिक इवोल्यूशन ये दोनों के दोनों सच्चिदानंद को ही स्थिति को प्राप्त करेंगे क्यों क्योंकि ये दोनों के दोनों उसकी ही मैनिफेस्टेशन है लेकिन ये इंडिविजुअल इवोल्यूशन होगा एक लेवल पर जाने के बाद जब हम माइंड से हायर माइंड की ओर बढ़ेंगे हायर माइंड इल्यूमिन माइंड इंटिव माइंड ओवर माइंड और ये सुपर माइंड की स्थिति में जब हमको ये लेकर के जाएगा तब जाकर के ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन की प्रक्रिया संपन्न होगी और उस ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन की प्रक्रिया के माध्यम से हम धीरे धीरे इवोल्यूशन को प्राप्त करेंगे तो ऐसा नहीं है वो स... हम तो ये कहें कि अगर सडन भी वो कर सकता है लेकिन वो सडन सृष्टि क्यों करे इसकी कोई बाध्यता है क्या एप्सोलूट पर 
कोई बाध्यता नहीं है क्रिएशन एब्सोलूट इज नॉट कंडीशन बाय क्रिएशन वो क्रिएशन से कंडीशन नहीं है कि क्रिएशन है तो होती ही रहेगी होती ही रहेगी ऐसा नहीं जब वो चाहे क्रिएशन कर ले जब वो चाहे अगर ऐसा हम नहीं मानते हैं तो एब्सोलूट को एब्सोलूट मानने का हमारे पास कोई आधार नहीं होगा तो कोई चीज ऐसी जो एब्सोलूट जो एब्सोलूट कंडीशन एब्सोलूट हो वो एब्सोलूट हो ही नहीं सकता ये अपने आप में विरोधी कर्म हो जाएंगे कॉन्ट्राडिक्टी कर्म हो जाएंगे यह कहना कि एब्सोलूट इज फ्री और दूसरे तरफ हम ये कहें कि एब्सोलूट इज कंडीशन फॉर क्रिएशन it will be a self contradiction and this type of contradiction is not there in arvindo philosophy because arvindo has tried to eliminate all the contradictions sare contradictions ko hi sir arvind ne dur karne ki koshish kiya hai jo hamari parampara mein aate hain aur usi mein aap dekhte hain ki jitne sare hain professor pradhan ji ne bhi jiski charcha kiya shubh aur ashubh ke bare mein vidya aur avidya ke bare mein jad aur chetan ke bare mein jitne sare ye virodh hain in sare virodhon ka samadhan karne ki koshish sri arvind ne kiya hai logic of infinite ke dwara ek aisi kunji hai logic of infinite jisse wo sare virodhon ka wo samadhan karke aur integral nature jo absolute ka hai usko sthapit karne ki koshish karte hain aur rahi baat ek shubh ek mitra ne bhi prashn kiya tha ki atiman ki kya avashyakta hai शर्विंद के दर्शन में अतिमन वह केंद्र बिंदु है जिसके चारों तरफ उनका हर दर्शन घूमता है वो तो केंद्र है और उनका दर्शन सारे दार्शनिक बिंदु उसके परिधि पर हैं। उसी केंद्र की परिधि क्यों अतिमन की आवश्यकता क्या है बहुत प्रैक्टिकल समाधान श्री अरविंद देते हैं इसका अगर सूर्य के प्रकाश को अगर हम सीधे देखना चाहें तो सूर्य के प्रकाश को देख भी नहीं पाएंगे और हमारी आंख भी खराब हो जाएगी मगर वही अगर कोई एक चश्मा बीच में लगा ले और देखने की कोशिश करें तो शायद हम उसको कुछ देख भी पाएंगे कुछ समझ भी पाएंगे हमारी आंख भी नहीं खराब ये जो कॉन्सियसनेस फोर्स है ये ये जो सुपर माइंड है ये कॉन्सियसनेस ये 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 भी कॉन्सियसनेस फोर्स का ही एक रूप है ये भी सृजनात्मक शक्ति ही है लेकिन जब यह अज्ञान में अपने आप को इन्वॉल्व करता है तो जितने पूरे ज्ञान की शक्ति के साथ अगर आप अपने आप अपने आप को अगर इन्वॉल्व कर दे तो श्रीरविंद कहते हैं कि ज्ञान के इस अभिघात को अज्ञान बर्दाश्त नहीं कर सकता है इसलिए आवश्यकता है कि बीच में किसी को स्वीकार किया जाए जो इन दोनों के बीच में ज्ञान और अज्ञान के बीच में दोनों के बीच में एक ऐसी स्थिति हो जो एक तरफ से ज्ञान को अज्ञान के क्षेत्र में उतारने में भी संभव हो और जो ज्ञान को अज्ञान के रूप में अज्ञान को ज्ञान के रूप में भी परिणत करने में कोशिश हो एंड दैट इज द सुपर माइंड ओवरमाइंड से जब ओवरमाइंड से ट्रांसफार्म करते हैं तो सुपरमाइंड चले जाते हैं और जब सुपरमाइंड से जब हमको जगत की अभी जब जगत में अभिव्यक्त उसको करना होता है तो ओवरमाइंड के माध्यम से वो अपने आप को जगत में अभिव्यक्त करता है इसलिए सृष्टि के लिए केवल और केवल ओवरमाइंड सिर्फ नहीं कहते हैं कि ओवर जिम्मेदार है और दूसरा जिम्मेदार नहीं है वो सीधे नहीं ओवर के माध्यम से वो क्रिएशन करता है ये बहुत सारे ऐसे प्रश्न है प्रधान जी ने इनकी चर्चा भी किया और मैं क्या कहूँ समय तो जितना मेरे पास हम लोगों के पास था उसका हम लोगों ने मैक्सिमम सर से हम लोगों ने सुना छोटी मोटी बातें जो मुझे समझ में आई जो मैं आपके साथ शेयर कर सकता था अरविंद का मैं जैसा आनंद जी ने कहा मैं कोई अरविंद की परंपरा में इस विभाग में नहीं हूँ मैं भी विद्यार्थी हूँ परंपरा में तो हम लोगों के गुरु लोग थे जिन्होंने श्री अरविंद दर्शन को पढ़ने और पढ़ाने का काम किया मैंने भी पढ़ा ही है जरूर कुछ सोचा है समझा है श्री अरविंद को चूंकि अरविंद पर मेरा काम भी है शंकर अरविंद और वशुबंधु पर तीनों पर मैंने काम किया है कॉन्सियसनेस पर तो स्वाभाविक है कि अरविंद मुझे पढ़ने को मिले और उसमें जो कुछ भी मैं पढ़ पाया जो कुछ मैं समझ पाया श्री अरविंद को और जो कुछ सर के लेक्चर को मैंने आ, मैंने समराइज करने की कोशिश किया इन इन बिंदुओं पर और कुछ अपने मित्रों के प्रश्नों को भी लेकर के हमने अपनी बात कहने की कोशिश किया उसमें अगर कोई त्रुटि होगी तो मैं सबसे पहले तो बड़े भाई से ही निवेदन करूंगा कि आप क्षमा कीजिएगा क्योंकि क्षमा बढ़न को चाहिए छोटन को उत्पात तो मैं उत्पात ही कर रहा हूं कि आप इस क्षेत्र में और शेष तो आप मुझे क्षमा करेंगे हमारे मित्र लोग भी क्षमा करेंगे अगर कुछ अच्छा हो तो जरूर मैं सार्थक मानूंगा अपने वक्तव्य को इतना मैं जरूर कहूंगा कि अंतिम में जो सर ने कहा था एक बात कहा था कि श्री अरविंद के दर्शन की आवश्यकता क्या है आज और इनडायरेक्ट वे में टंडन जी ने भी ये प्रश्न उठाया था हिंसा के माध्यम से तो इसके बारे में मैं और कुछ तो नहीं कहूंगा मैं केवल हबीब का एक शेर कह के मैं अपनी बात समाप्त करूंगा और वो ये कि बेहतर दिनों की आस में बैठे हुए हबीब बेहतर दिनों की आस में बैठे हुए हबीब हम बेहतरीन दिन भी गंवाते चले गए धन्यवाद जय भारत
थैंक यू वेरी मच सर बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद कार्यक्रम अपने समापन की ओर है और अब एट लास्ट बट नॉट लीस्ट मैं आग्रह करूंगी डॉक्टर बालेश्वर जी से कि वो फॉर्मल वोट ऑफ थैंक्स धन्यवाद ज्ञापन के द्वारा इस कार्यक्रम को परिणति प्रदान करने का कष्ट करें Good afternoon to all of you. Myself Baleshwar from this department. After today's lecture, it's our sense of gratitude to express the thankfulness to this August gathering. As you all know, this Radha Krishna lecture series. is being held under the celebration of azadi ka amrit mahotsav so firstly i would like to thank professor anand mishra sir honorable head of the department and really the source of source inspiration and designer of such like academic programs so i heartily thank you sir now i would like to utter my deep sense of thanks to today's speaker professor rc pradhan friends as you know he is a highly esteemed philosopher across our country and abroad he has been an alumni of this department this is also a special with professor pradhan that he started his academic journey of research by publishing his first article on sri aurobindo in pragya journal of banaras hindu university he traversed a long journey of academia in analytic tradition philosophy of mind and wittgenstein's philosophy in the area of western philosophy and now he sees and explores the perfection in sri aurobindo's integral philosophy so i thank you sir for putting sri aurobindo's philosophy in such a clear parallels i thank you from the core of my heart and now i would i want to stop my uh, uh, i want to stop myself giving thanks to shrimati jhanasi pradhan who is dharma patni of professor pradhan and the lady and the lady who has been a constant maker of mr ramesh chandra as professor pradhan so i thank you ma'am for the core of my heart now i would like to extend my sincere thanks to professor sp pande for your elaborate presidential speech i thank you once again sir again in this sequence i thank dr shruti misra ji for beautiful convening this lecture program now i extend my thanks to professor rk jha sir professor jyotsna ma'am dr dharmjang ji from malviya munnyal nusilan kendra dr kalpana ji dr rahul ji and uh, other colleagues i also like to thank dr rajiv for enchanting mangala charan and sneha and aswarya for rendition of kulgit again i would like to extend my sincere thanks to uh, ashish anand and subham misra for technical assistance and uh, other dear students for uh, their presence for making this lecture program very successful so i thank you all thank you very much uh 
in students i would like to mention some more names as uh, uh, rahul vaishali uh, are also present here rajalakshmi aradhana uh, are also present here so it was very much necessary to give vote of thanks to them too now uh, ab uh, iske baad main is sabha ka visarjan karna chahungi uske purv ki visarjan kiya jaye main uh, rashtragaan ke sath चाहूंगी कि आप सभी सावधानी की मुद्रा में आकर के और मेरे साथ मेरे कलीग्स यदि आए तो मुझे बहुत खुशी होगी आप माइक पर आए जन गण मन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविण उत्कल बंग विंध्य हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उत्कल जल धितरंग तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मांगे गाहे तव जय गाथा जय गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे